In experiment E22, we're going to measure some RC and LR time constants, and we're going to look at some transients uh, that show up in, in circuits under certain circumstances. All of your studying so far in circuits has been after they have reached the steady state. But the instant you turn on the power to a circuit, sometimes some odd things can happen. And we're going to look at that in this experiment. The first thing we want to do is measure the time constant for an RC circuit. That is a circuit with resistance and capacitance. We know that if the larger a capacitor is, the more time it takes for it to charge up. We also know that the larger the resistance in the circuit is, the smaller the current we have to charge the capacitor. So it's not surprising that in a, in a RC circuit, the time constant is proportional to both R and C and to RC. So we're going to compare RC to the measured time constant of the circuit. Okay, now we're going to be using our function generator here, but we're going to set it to put out a square wave instead of a sine wave. Here's the circuit. We come from the output of the function generator, and remember that's the red one, and we go first to the variable resistance, that's over here on this side of the box, and for this we want the 100K resistor turned all the way up, and the 2.5K turned all the way down, so the nominal resistance will be 100K. Now in series with that, we put the capacitance. And here, by throwing this switch, we can either get a 0.01 microfarad or a 0.001 microfarad capacitor. Let's start with the 0.01 microfarad capacitor. And then we have to complete the circuit, of course, by going back to the function generator. Now, we want to be measuring the voltage across the capacitor in this case. <clears throat> so that means we need our voltmeter, the oscilloscope, right here. Okay, now let me turn on the function generator. And this is turn off channel two. All right, there we go. Now, this is supposed to be a square wave, so why does it look like a sawtooth? Well, the problem is that right now the frequency of the function generator is so high that the capacitor never has time to get fully charged. So let me turn this frequency down. Now as I do that, let me look at a few more cycles here. Okay, let me turn this frequency down some more. All right, now we're starting to see that finally the voltage across the capacitor is finally getting up to the voltage of the square wave I'm applying. This is the signal we want to see. Now the first thing I need to do is center it on the x-axis, so I'll use the vertical position knob to bring the channel one arrow up to the x-axis. Now, what I need to do is measure the time it takes to go from minus V to zero. This is minus V, this is plus V, coming from the square wave generator. And I want to measure what's called the rise time, the time to go from minus V up to zero. 
So first of all, let me make it a little bigger. Okay, that's pretty good. It starts right here and goes up to cross the axis right there. So I'll bring in the time cursors. I'll set one of the cursors right here. And I'll set the other cursor over here where the signal crosses the axis. Yeah, it's about somewhere in there. So that time is about 640 microseconds. Now the equation developed in the instructions tells us that this rise time divided by the natural log of 2 gives us the time constant. <clears throat> so if we take a look at the values of R and C, we have 10 to the plus 5 for R, we have 10 to the minus 8 for F, or for capacitance, so 10 to the plus 5 times 10 to the minus 8 is about 10 to the minus 3 seconds, or 1 millisecond, and 0.64 milliseconds divided by log 2 is about that value. You want to keep in mind that the components R and C in this box have 5 or 10 percent tolerances. Now the second part involves an LR circuit. So let's take a look at that part. Now, for an inductive circuit, we want to measure current rather than voltage because the voltage across an inductor does not look like the current. It looks like the derivative of the current. And so, in order to get something that looks like current, we're going to need to measure the voltage across the resistance because resistor voltage is I times R, so we see something that has the same phase as current. Now, because of the fact that this is an earth ground and the ground of these inputs are earth grounded, we have to be very careful that both of these are connected to the same ground, which means that the component we measure always has to be last in the circuit next to ground. Okay, so we come from the square wave generator to the inductor, that's this, let's put it in here. We come out of the inductor and go to the variable resistor, and then we come out of the resistor and back to complete the circuit. Okay, now these were set up many years ago before everyone had calculators and computers and so the numbers were chosen to make the calculations easy. So we've got about 2.5 kilo ohms here. We have about 25 millihenries here. Um, the bigger the inductor the longer it takes for the current to reach the steady state. That makes sense. On the other hand, the bigger the resistor is, the smaller the final current in the circuit, and the more quickly the circuit can come to that current. So the time constant in an RL circuit is L divided by R. In this case, L is 25 millihenries, R is 2.5 kilo ohms. If you take 25 divided by 2.5, that's 10, and milli divided by kilo is micro, so our time constant ought to be somewhere around 10 microseconds. So let's check it out. Remember, we want to have our voltmeter looking at the resistor voltage. So let's put it right here. And that puts the ground of the oscilloscope 
at the same place as the ground of the function generator. If you don't do that, you won't see what you need to see. Okay, now let's turn the function generator on and see what we're looking at. Well, it just looks like a big old square wave. And that's because the part we need to see is right here in this rise. And so we're wasting a whole lot of time looking at steady state. So I'm going to raise the frequency on the function generator way up. Let's see here. Let's see if we can get to it on this scale. Ah, yeah, there's what we want to see. Let me adjust this a little more. Okay. That's plenty good. Now I'll spread this out. Okay. So here again, we're seeing here's minus V, the resistor voltage, and then the current reverses direction. And finally, over about here, it gets up to about plus V. Once again, we want to measure this rise time. So we use exactly the same techniques and we make it as big as we can. We bring in the time cursors and I'll put one cursor right here. There's a little transient there which occurs because the inductor wants to act like inertia and keep the current going in the same direction. So there's a little oscillation there. And I'll put the other cursor right here. And that's about right there. Now we're getting about 6.4 microseconds. And if we divide that by the 0.69, that's the natural log of 2. Oh, we're going to get about 9 microseconds. A little less than the 10 predicted by these numbers. But again, 10% tolerance components. Uh, allow for that very easily. The final part of the experiment involves measuring the resonant ringing frequency of the circuit and that happens if we start increasing the resistance of the circuit. As the resistance increases you can see the rise time is getting smaller and the time constant of the circuit is getting smaller. We continue on up and a very interesting thing happens. We start seeing this completely different frequency here. Let's look at some more of that. Okay, instead of coming up and making a square turn like the square wave we're imposing on the circuit, it oscillates here. This, for example, is what happens when a PA system feeds back and makes that screeching sound that everybody knows so well. What we want you to do is to measure this frequency and <coughs> calculate from this, the stray capacitance in the wires and connections. If I push on these wires, you can maybe see that this frequency changes a little bit, and it's because I'm changing the stray capacitance in the circuit. So again, you can make this large. Yeah, that's pretty good right there. We can bring in the time cursors, put one of them on that peak and one of them on that peak here and here. And it tells us we're looking at about 94 kilohertz uh, on this value of the inductance. If I change the inductance, it changes that resonant frequency. 
Okay, so measure that and put it into the equation in the write-up and calculate the stray capacitance.